assessment is the first step of the nutrition care process. And if you recall, we use the acronym ABCD to identify the, the type of data that we collect, anthropometrics, biochemical, clinical, and dietary. And although dietary is the last on that list, it's going to be where we start. When gathering dietary data to complete a nutrition assessment, there are three key elements. One, we need to measure dietary intake, or what does someone consume? Two, we need to know the nutrient composition of those foods. And then finally, three, we need to have some food and nutrition standards. We will look at each one of these elements as we go through the course, and this week we're going to focus in on those food and nutrition standards. It may seem obvious that we're going to use some type of food and nutrition standard to assess someone's dietary intake. But there are so many out there. Which one should we use? It seems that everyone and their brother has some type of recommendation about what we should or should not eat. For this class, we're going to focus on those food and nutrition guidelines that have been developed by the Food and Nutrition Board of the Institute of Medicine, National Academy of Sciences, and then the Advisory Committee from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. These will include the Dietary Reference Intake, which includes subsets of them, the RDAs, upper limits, and the acceptable macronutrient distribution range, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, MyPlate, and the Daily Values. For each one of these, you should be able to give a general description, which I like to say you should be able to explain it in your own words to your grandma, then also state its overall purpose or its end point. What would you tell someone if they did not meet that standard? And then identifying which one of these you should be used for different assessment purposes. Sometimes when you're first learning these, they can seem very, very similar, but they are unique and have their own specific purposes. Personally, I struggle learning all of these too. But I found two things that helped me keep them straight. One was a graphic demonstration that helped me visualize their relationship. And two was, was understanding the historical context of when they were developed. So that's how I'm going to go through these. When I ask an introductory nutrition class if they've ever heard of RDAs or the Dietary Guidelines, I might get one or two hands up out of 100 to 200 students. But when I ask the same group of students if they've ever heard of the MyPlate, or the daily values on the food labels, I get almost 100% awareness. This graphic shows how the DRIs, which includes the RDAs, and the Dietary Guidelines for Americans are the basis for our more commonly known standards of the MyPlate and the daily values on food labels. The DRIs and the Dietary Guidelines are considered the keystone standards, or the science first standards. MyPlate and the daily values on food labels are called translational standards. MyPlate and the Daily Values have been specifically designed to translate the DRIs and the dietary guidelines so the average consumer can understand and use them. Thus, it's not surprising that students have seen the translational standards but not aware of those science-based standards from which they came. This graphic provides a visualization of how these different food and nutrition standards relate to each other. So now I'm going to go on and provide some information about the historical context of how each one of these was developed. We're going to start with the DRIs, or the Dietary Reference Intakes, but to look at its historical context, we need to go back in time and talk specifically about part of the DRIs called the RDAs, the Recommended Dietary Allowances. So let's take a look. The RDAs were first established in 1941. It can be helpful to remember that this was during World War II, and our understanding of vitamins was very new. The first vitamin isolated, thiamine, was in 1926 and Nobel Prizes related to vitamin discoveries were won in 1928, 29, 34, 37, 38, and 43. That tells you how, how exceptional it was to understand these vitamins. In an effort to affect national defense, RDA standards were developed to prevent vitamin deficiency in our soldiers in that war, and eventually they were expanded to the average citizen. Updates to the RDA recommendations were made on a regular basis but starting in the 1970s and increasingly in the 1980s and early 90s, there was a clash between the intent of the RDAs and what the public wanted. Here's a question to help explain that clash. Do you or someone you know take a vitamin C supplement? If you answered yes, then think about why someone is taking that supplement. I would wager a bet that your answer is to prevent or reduce cold symptoms. But RDAs for vitamin C did not focus on the amount to prevent and reduce cold symptoms. It focuses on the amount to prevent deficiency diseases, specifically scurvy. The nutrition community wanted the RDAs to maintain that focus, 
on adequacies and preventing deficiencies, but the public wanted information about beyond deficiencies, like reducing symptoms of colds. What to do? In the late 1990s, they decided to broaden the existing guidelines, and they collectively put these broadened guidelines together and called them the Dietary Reference Intakes, or the DRIs. Within those, they maintained the RDAs with its focus on preventing nutrient deficiencies, but then added other standards, including the tolerable upper limit, which provides a standard for excess intake, and the acceptable macronutrient distribution range, to provide a guidance on the percent of calories from carbohydrate, protein, and fat that aligns with consuming adequate nutrient intakes. You can think about the DRIs as a title of a book with a chapter on RDAs, a chapter on ULs, and a chapter on AMDRs. It just so happens that that chapter on the RDAs is older than the DRI book. This greatly expanded the amount of information, and it took close to 10 years to publish these expanded guidelines for all nutrients, and they continue to be updated as new information becomes available. In summary, the DRIs are a collection of nutrient standards. In that collection are the RDAs, with its focus on guidelines preventing nutrient deficiencies, ULs, with a focus on preventing excess nutrient intake, and AMDRs, which gives a range of distribution of calories from carbohydrate, protein, and fat. You will notice that there is not a standard that focuses on optimal health or preventing those cold symptoms. We don't really have a standard, any standard out there, that defines optimal health. But we do have a standard, that second first science first standard, the Dietary Guidelines of Americans, with its focus on preventing chronic disease. So we're going to take a look at that next. I'm going to have you look at this one-day dietary intake to help you think through why we needed more dietary standards and what this clash was between these RDA standards that were available and what the population really wanted. So what would be your cursory nutrition assessment of this intake? I'm going to guess that you're not thinking about B vitamins and the amount of iron in it. I suspect you're, you're thinking more about the fat and carbohydrate levels. You think maybe too much fat? But what about that avocado? It's a good source of fat, whatever good means. And what about those carbohydrates? Maybe too much, maybe too much simple carbohydrates. Now, as you think through those questions, think about why the amount and types of fat and carbohydrates are important. With rare exceptions, we do not have deficiencies of fats and carbohydrates. Now, those nutrients are more linked with the diet-related chronic diseases, such as cardiovascular disease and obesity. So, is there so as our society was moving away from concerns about nutrient inadequacies, the RDA nutrient standards just could not provide a way to assess a diet for its risk of developing these diseases that Americans were dying from. Thus, we needed a new nutrition standard. And it, one was developed, and it was called the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, or we usually just call it the Dietary Guidelines. It was first published in 1980 and has been updated every five years since then. The dietary guidelines are distinct from the RDAs in multiple ways. The RDA give recommendations for 12 different groups based upon gender, age, and then life stages, so pregnancy and lactation. And when you're going to assess an, an individual's nutrient intake, you would look up the specific RDA and compare it to the right age and gender group. In contrast, the dietary guideline has only one set of recommendations for all individuals over the age of two. Thus, these recommendations need to be able to work across a wide range of energy needs. Most dietary guidelines are given as a percent of total calories, or there are some that are given a certain amount of a nutrient for every 1,000 calories consumed. Another difference between the RDAs and dietary guidelines is that there is an RDA for every uh, recommendation for every essential nutrient, but the dietary guideline only gives guidelines for those nutrients that are linked with diet-related chronic diseases. So there's an RDA for thiamine, but there's not a dietary guideline. And those essential nutrients that are related to, uh, to chronic diseases will have two standards. For example, carbohydrates. The RDA, adult RDA for carbohydrates, is 130 grams. And then there is the dietary guidelines for carbohydrate that says 45 to 65 percent of total calories. So when you are assessing someone's intake for carbohydrate, if we're looking for the amount that's needed to meet nutrient needs, We'd look at the RDAs, but if we're assessing the carbohydrate for the amounts to reduce our risk for chronic disease, we'd use the dietary guidelines. As we have looked at these two science-based key 
nutrient standards. We know that they're not as well known, but they are the basis for those which most people know. So now let's talk about those translational standards that people know about, the MyPlate and the daily values. Starting with the MyPlate. So both of them are going to translate the RDAs, those nutrient-based standards, the RDAs and dietary guidelines, but in different ways. My plates will take them and translate them to a food pattern. So it's our food-based standards. If someone follows the recommended my plate food patterns, we would expect that person to consume adequate amount of essential nutrients, as well as eating in a way to reduce the risk for diet-related chronic diseases. So let's see, um, this is achieved by two mechanisms. With my plate, the RDAs is translated by how foods are put into groups. Foods are put into groups based upon the nutrient content. For example, foods in the dairy group must provide a significant amount of calcium. Cream cheese may be found in the dairy section of the grocery store, but it's not considered a part of the dairy group of my plate because it's a very low source of calcium. It's important then to know those key nutrients with each food group. If your client is not meeting the food recommendation of the my plate, you're going to assess that they're likely at risk for that key nutrient. So if they're low in the dairy group, you're going to assess that they're likely to be low in calcium. Dietary guidelines are translated in the my plate by the distribution and portions of the food groups on the plate. If we look at a meal and compare it to the my plate, and maybe there's not enough fruits and vegetables there, we not only think about not having enough vitamin A and vitamin C, but we also think about that distribution of the carbohydrate, protein, and fat, and how it might be compared to the dietary guidelines. So we come to our last standard, the second translational standard, the daily values. The daily values are used on food labels and make it possible to compare the nutritional value of foods at the point of purchase. And just like the MyPlate, both the RDAs and the dietary guidelines have been translated into this standard. The actual process of, of squeezing those RDAs and the dietary guidelines into the standard is a lot of math and a lot of details, and I'm not going to go through that. But here are the values. And basically, these these vitamin and mineral standards are coming from the RDAs. They're a subset of it. And then the, di the macronutrients, the carbohydrate, protein, and fat, are really coming from the dietary guidelines. They're using the, the calories, 2,000 calories, as their point of reference. And then they use those uh, recommendations, the percent of calories, to actually come up with the specific value. Once we can do that, we can do the math to come up with percent of daily values, and we can compare one food to the next. In summer, we've gone over the major food and nutrition standards that we're going to be using this semester. They can seem very similar, but they are distinct. And using a graphic representation of how they relate to each other and understanding their historical context a bit can help us distinguish them. And as we use them, it will be important that you use the correct standard when you're doing a dietary assessment to determine if, if a diet is within the recommendation or outside and what does it mean if someone doesn't meet it.